Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Follower Podcast. Uh, it's been a while. Missed a few episodes the last two weeks because, number one, I was in Rotterdam and Amsterdam. Matt Burschma, if you are listening to this, man, I love you. You're one of the best Dutch humans just ever. Number two, let's talk about the Netherlands for a second. How is this whole country not struggling with diabetes? Because everywhere you go, it's just sugar. Hachelslag, if you know what that is. I don't, I don't even know. It's just sugar, sweetness. I think it's because they ride bicycles everywhere. Nowhere in my life have I experienced uh, basically a highway system for bicycles. Unbelievable. And I think it's also because they're so, so tall. I think so. All there's, there's space for all the sugar to go. You know what I mean? Just It's uh, amazing. Love you guys. Love the Netherlands. Love Rotterdam. Fire starters. Shout out to you humans. Why I'm here and you are the business. Revive DTS. You know you're the best, and uh, we just we just had such a good time in Rotterdam, so that's why I didn't do a podcast then, and then when I got back and I was ready to uh, do a podcast and catch up, turned on my Mac and looked at the screen, and it gave me that flashing file with a question mark on it, which I had no idea what it was, but we live in the land of Google. How great. And so I Googled, and I found out that it was a hard drive cable, and then here's where you've got to be proud of me, guys. Little old uh, techno peasant me, I ordered my very own hard drive cable on Amazon. Thank you, Amazon. Cable came. I took apart the whole Mac, put back together the whole Mac with a new cable in it, turned it on, and the thing was working. So now, not only am I a ministry missionary, Jesus kind of person guy, but I am also, in fact, an IT technician for Mac, which I'm very excited about. So that's what's been going on, and that's why the lateness. So apologies for that, but we'll be catching you up with all the new podcasts as we keep going. Exciting news. If you know that I've obviously been here, DTS Discipleship Training School, for the past three months. Can you believe it? It's three months. How do I know it's three months? Because lecture phase is over. So uh, having lessons every day for the whole week and these different themes that we've been looking at has kind of come to the end. And so what a, t- what a time. What a time to be alive. What a time to be alive. And next week, Friday, I'll be getting on a plane and I'll be flying to Asia for three months of outreach in uh, countries that for safety's sake I can't talk about over here. But if you want to know where we're going and uh, you want me to fill you in some more, you can message me directly and we'll see what we can do about that. But it's going to be great. It's going to be amazing. Three months cruising around a couple of countries and just uh, asking Jesus, what are you doing in this place and how do we follow you and how do we invite people into the beautiful story that is the good news of this king who's brought a new kingdom. So I am I'm so excited to meet some new people, make some new friends, encounter new cultures and see the bigness of God transcend my own little worldview. Speaking of worldviews, That's what this episode is all about, world views. I first arrived here in Germany and I had a shower, okay, in one of these baths. You know that when you have the baths and there's like the little handle shower thing and it's got uh, the curtain and you wrap the curtain, you close the curtain and then hopefully it doesn't spill out onto the floor, right? So I have my shower, do my shower thing, get out of the shower and then what I realize is that I I haven't closed the curtain very well um, and so there's water all over the floor. And so in walks a German man who is uh, sharing the room with me. And I said to him, don't you guys have anything that we can clean up the floor with? And he says, no, I don't think we do. So I said, well, what do you do when you shower and you wet the floor? He says, well, when we shower, we just don't wet the floor. (laughs) Which I thought was really, really funny. And I thought the reason I shared that is because it epitomizes the difference in worldview, right? I'm a South African. We are like Budmakaplan make it happen stuff, you know, when I'm pretty sure when I listen to all the stuff that's going on in ESCOM, it's not going to be too, too long until we have like individualized electricity power stations happening in people's backyards in the plots of Benoni or something, or like people riding on exercise bikes and powering entire cities. Like South Africa, we're about that, you know, stuff breaks and then we fix it and we just make it work because that's how we do the things. That's what it's all about. 
Um, but that's a worldview. That's how we see things. In Germany, the reason why they don't spend a whole lot of time figuring out how to fix things is because they just don't let things break. <laughs> it's, a, it's a whole different way of seeing the world. They, these people are so organized. Everything works. The reason they can have an autobahn with no speed limit is because people understand all the road signals and signs and people stay in the lanes and do the things. Can you imagine in South Africa with, <laughs> with our road system if we had an autobahn? I think I think it would be I think it would be a problem, and so all all that to say that's one primary example of worldviews. What is a worldview? How does it all work? What does it mean? That's exactly what we're going to talk about in the next episode. Who is Jesus? What is he doing? And what does it mean to follow him in the world today? My name is Matt Lewis. This is the Follower Podcast, and everyone is invited to the conversation. So, here we go. Worldviews. What is a worldview? I think one of the best ways to try and describe a worldview is it's kind of like the app on your phone, right? You know, you've got those apps on your phone that are operating in the background. You're not even aware that they are operating, and yet they are operating. iOS, uh, you know, in, in Mac, because now I'm an IT technician. It's, it's the operating software that happens behind the scenes and makes everything work. And if you had a different operating software, your whole computer would work differently. And so you're not necessarily conscious of it. We don't necessarily turn on our computers and admire our iOS. But without it, uh, our whole experience of the computer would be profoundly different. Another way to think of it would be to think of it as glasses, right? You put on these glasses... And you see the world through the lens that is on your face. If you had sunglasses, you would see the world darker than if you didn't have sunglasses. Or you've heard the phrase, that person wears rose-tinted glasses because they're always positive with everything that they do, right? This is what we're talking about when we talk about worldview. Worldview is basically the lens through which you see the world. It is your subconscious operating system that causes you to react and um, be a part of things that you're not even necessarily conscious of. It's happening in the background. The worldview is built of uh, religious beliefs. It's built of your socialization. Uh, where did you grow up? How, what is your education level? It's built of the books you read. It's built of media, the stuff you watch. It's built of friendship circles. It's built of languages. It's built of inherited cultures. You know, some of us understand the difference between warm cultures and cold cultures, communal cultures and individualistic cultures, uh, Christian worldviews versus other ideological worldviews. We have uh, the difference between if you're a single person, you're relating to the world in one way. If you're a married person with kids, you're relating to the world in another way. And so our worldviews, the lenses that we're wearing on our face are built of a billion different things, many of which we're not even aware of. And so, why is it important to know this? It's important to know this because not everybody's wearing the same glasses as you are. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. Not everybody's wearing the same glasses as you are. Not everybody sees the world in the same way that you see the world. And so, if we don't recognize that, then one of the challenges we may have is that our expectation is that everybody thinks like we think. Everyone responds like we respond, that we are right and everybody else is wrong. And, and that's just not the case. Also, we may find ourselves to be the victims of dysfunctional worldviews, and we don't know why stuff is broken in our world because we haven't ascertained the fact that we're wearing broken glasses. Imagine for a second... If you uh, really needed glasses, and yet the glasses that you put on your face were the wrong prescription, and you just carried walking around the world thinking that everything was blurry, and you just thought that that's the way it is. Trees are blurry, lights are blurry, the road is blurry, and so you responded to the world as if it were all blurry. What you would need is for someone to say to you, hey, listen, you've got the wrong prescription glasses. And if you changed your prescription, you changed the way you see the world. And if you change the way you see the world, you change the way you respond to the world. Can you see? So worldview is actually a really, really, really big deal, but, but we don't give it a lot of attention because it operates at such a subconscious level. But what I'd like for us to pull up today is just a few points around worldview and, and what it means for your life and how you can actually engage in it. So let's talk first of all about the cycle of perception, action, response, okay? So you see the world in a way, you perceive things. 
as a result of your perception, you you have actions, you do things, right? So, uh, as an example, when I look at the world, I I'm an eternal optimist. That's just my <laughs> worldview, right? So I think that things are possible. And the reason I think that things are possible is because I have a deeper theological conviction, which we'll get into in just a second. But because I have that perception, because I perceive the world as a place of possibility, my action is an action of creativity and risk. So I I step into things because I have the conviction that something can be made, something can be done. We can do that problem over there, we could do something about it. We don't just have to resign ourselves to the fact that that's just how things are going to be forever. No, we can we can usher in new realities, right? And and again, we'll talk about this in just a second, and where that conviction comes from. But I have I have a perception, and because of that perception, it produces some actions. Now those actions create responses. Okay, so I walk into a space. I see something that's broken and something that needs fixing or something that needs addressing. Or I walk into a space and I see things that are wrong, but I also see just as many things that are right. And so as a result, I respond to those things and my action creates a response in and of itself. So people respond to me because of how I respond to my perception. Do you see it? So I walk into a place, something's broken, I move to correct it, and I do correct it. And then I get a positive response that reaffirms my perspe- my perception. So people look at that and they say, yes, you, you saw that something could be done, you did something, and it fixed some stuff. Now what does that do in me? And so when I get, when I, when I'm when I see that I was right, what does it do in me? It reinforces the perception that things don't have to be the way they are. This is the idea of faith, right? It's having the perception that there is a God, stepping out in action as if there were a God, then experiencing the reality of that God that reinforces the perception that there is a God. <laughs> do you see it? So it's perception, action, response, perception. And this is how worldview works. It kind of works on the cyclical movement of of a predetermined perspective, an action in response, and then a reinforcing response from the world. This also works in a negative way, right? You You are born into a community, into a space, into a family that enculturated you to believe that you are ugly, You walk into a room and because your perception is that you are ugly, you uh, have a profound lack of confidence. You don't know how to enter in conversation with people. You don't know how to to kind of greet people. You kind of shrink into the back. You become maybe what some people call a wallflower. You, you, You shrink down because there's this deep insecurity in you. And then the world responds to you in kind. So because you resign yourself from the room, you resign yourself from engagements, you're reluctant to step out. Uh, The people in the room don't take recognition of you. They don't recognize you. And you feel like your perception is reinforced that you are not worth recognizing. But the likelihood is if that if you had come into that room with a different perspective perception to start with, the room would have responded to you differently. Have you ever you've ever met people where you think to yourself, uh, when I look at this person, physically they don't necessarily have anything outstanding about them, and yet they carry a kind of the world would call it charisma that makes them magnetic, right? This is worldview. This is what it's about. They have a perception that they're awesome, so they act awesome, and then the world responds to them like they're awesome, which reinforces their perception that they're awesome. And all of a sudden, they are far more confident than their physicality gives them reason to be, which is a wonderful thing, that they're not bound by their external appearance. How wonderful. How great. Okay? And at the same time, you've met other people who externally, on the outside, man, these people are beautiful. They should be on the cover of a magazine or something. And yet their perception is that they're not. They're profoundly insecure for a whole bunch of reasons. And so they step into a room and they don't have that charisma. They lack that confidence. And as a result, the room responds to them in kind. And although they're beautiful to look at with the eyes, there's nothing magnetic or attractive about them in their personality. And that starts to reinforce that negative perception that they have. Do you see it? So this is how worldview works. Um, you, ha- you see the world in a way, you respond to the world in a way, and the world responds to you in a way which reinforces the way you see the world. And, and if we don't critically analyze those initial perceptions, what happens is they get reinforced and reinforced and stronger and stronger and stronger until we can no longer really control um, how we are responding 
to the world. So what I'd like to do is to talk now about one worldview in particular, which is a biblical worldview, and why I think that this biblical worldview is is such a helpful lens and a right lens, and I would say a lens that corresponds with reality. So this is this in my mind would be the right way to posture yourself in order to respond to the world. And I'll tell you why in just a second. So here's why. Every worldview, uh, every lens that you're seeing the world through is ultimately trying to answer four big questions. Okay. And here are the four questions. And these are big words. So uh, I'll give them to you and then I'll unpack them in just a second. Every worldview is addressing the ontological issue, the epistemological issue, the axiological issue, and the teleological issue. Right, the ontological, epistemological, axiological, or teleological. So, ontology. Let's start with the first one. Ontology is basically the study of being. It's it's um it's a study of origin. Where did you come from? So every worldview, the way you relate to the world, uh, is trying to answer the question: Where do you come from? Now, you may not be a theist. In other words, you may not believe in God. You may be an atheist or an agnostic. You still have a perspective, a perception as to where you came from. That perception creates an action. That action evokes a response from the world that then reinforces your perception, strengthens that worldview. Okay. Uh, when it comes to epistemology, uh, epistemology is basically the study of knowledge. How do we know things? How do we know truth? Is truth something? Is it relative or is it not relative? Uh, and if it's not relative, uh, if there is such a thing as absolute truth, how do we know it? Where does it come from? Uh, what do we do with things like morality? How can we say there's no such thing as truth and then say that it's wrong to rape someone? These are the kinds of questions. And when we have an incoherent or broken worldview, these questions, these four, they struggle to hang together well. Okay, so again, whether you're an atheist or a theist, whether you believe in God or don't believe in God, you have a perspective about truth, and you were, you have this perception that causes you to act, and then the world responds to your action, which then either reinforces or questions your perception. Uh, when it comes to axiology, it is the study of worth, uh, the axis around which everything turns. In other words, what is of ultimate worth? What is the greatest good? What are you living your life? for? Uh, what is of highest value? What's the purpose of you being here? That's axiology. Again, theist or atheist, you have a perspective about this. Whether you believe in God or don't, you have a perspective about this. Teleology is the study of the end. Where is this all going? Like a telescope, teleology, uh, where is this all going? Do we all just become dust? Uh, do we just get thrown into a box and that's it? And if that is the case, what does that mean for the now? Uh, why does this have value and purpose and reason and meaning? Right? So when we look at these four big questions, our uh, ontology, epistemology, axiology, and teleology, uh, every worldview ultimately seeks to address these four questions. So you can summarize all worldview issues into these four questions. Now, let me tell you why I believe the biblical worldview is the best worldview when it comes to answering these four questions, not only because it corresponds with reality, but because, but in corresponding with reality, it is ultimately profoundly helpful for the way we live our lives today. So let's start with ontology, uh, the study of being. Who am I? Where am I from? Origin. If you don't believe in God, uh, then ultimately you are a product of time plus matter plus chance. So you are a bag of fizzing atoms. You're an, you are a cosmic accident. Okay. Now, at a philosophical level, and in a world that is prizing tolerance, um, and we're, because we are living in the wake of the ramifications, uh, and the ramifications of um, turning reason into a god, of allowing our ego to lift us up to the place where we want to become self-determining, and we get to decide what's right and wrong, that ancient lie from the Garden of Eden, um, if there is no God and there is no creator and we really are just a product of evolutionary process, time plus matter plus chance, if that's your worldview when it comes to your ontology, if your origin is a cosmic accident, uh, then in reality it compromises your human 
value. So as an example, why, why uh, is it any more tragic that a human being should be killed than that an ant should be killed? After all, we're all just the same. Hmm. So why when you step on a butterfly is that not murder? Or should it be? See, there's certain worldviews. Uh, there's a book by a guy called Ellis Potter, The Three Theories of Everything. You can have a look at it. Animism, theism, and atheism, basically. And uh, so there are some animistic worldviews, some perceptions of things uh, that would equate every living creature the same. This is why they won't kill worms. If you've ever seen Seven Years in Tibet, there's that classic scene where they're trying to build the cinema for the Dalai Lama. Um, <laughs> and they have to, uh, there's all these earthworms in the ground. And so they can't keep building the cinema because they're going to take the earthworms out of the ground, right? So at least that's, at least there's integrity in that view because in some senses, it, what it's trying to say is that all life uh, is valuable. So I get it. But the atheistic perspective in reality, uh, and this is probably why we have, uh, w- why we see the degradation of our society in so many ways, particularly as it comes to the sanctity of life, um, is because we don't believe we're from anywhere. And so, and so the holiness, the sacredness uh, of the human being is lost to us because we are also ultimately just a cosmic accident. However, from a biblical perspective, that's not the case. So my worldview, the lenses that I look at the world through, uh, start from a story in the book of Genesis of creation. And in the story, there is a creator. In other words, there's something before everything. In the beginning, there was God, and then God said, and everything came from this God. And this force, this creative personality uh, that is the center of all creation, out of which all creation flows, this creative force looked at everything that this creator had made and said that it needed more. It needed humanity. And that this humanity, and this is a key phrase here, would be made in the image of this God, imago Dei. Imago Dei, that's the Greek root there. Made in the image of God. And so my worldview then is to say that because we are from the creator and because this creator created us in its image, that we are actually walking vessels of the divine. We are eternity in a skin suit, every single human being. And so every human being has indelible value and worth built into you. And so when I'm sitting across the table from another human being, that is a sacred and holy space. Because I'm looking into the eyes of someone who's made in the image of the Creator. My worldview gives me reason to believe that. Now, at a gut level, we know, uh, we believe in things like human rights. But actually, if we were to critique the, the compatibility of the idea of human rights with the worldview of an atheistic perspective where there is no God, those things don't go together. Because why should there be human rights if humans aren't from somewhere, if, the, if humans have no eternal significance or value? This idea that human rights are things to be prized, uh, it's actually built on a Christian biblical worldview. <laughs> Right? Human rights violations only exist if humans are valuable, and humans are valuable only if they are actually from somewhere at a very fundamental level. And so you can see why your worldview really matters. You can also see why in places that don't have this worldview, you have expressions like the caste system, where people can be called the untouchables, because in a previous life they sinned and now have been resurrected, uh, reincarnated as someone who's who's divine purpose it is to live in a trash dump and not be touched and not be seen and be rejected by their communities because that's their worldview because according to that worldview this is the right and just order of things Um, and then we look into that and we say that's an atrocious way to treat human beings but we don't realize that the only reason we can say that is if every human being has infinite worth and the only way that they can really have worth is if they are from the heart of the creator every single one of us. And if there was a Jesus, perhaps, who came and said, I come for the lost one, I will leave the hundred, to, I'll leave the 99 to find the hundred, I'll turn over the house to find the lost coin, right? Love your neighbor as you love us. Everyone is valuable. That's a worldview issue. Um, and a lot of us are benefiting, benefiting from the fruits of a worldview that we've rejected in truth. So that's one reason that I really believe the biblical worldview 
is superior and important. Number two, epistemology, the study of knowledge. How do we know truth? And this is a big one in our culture, right? Because we're living in a post-modernity that, that has relativized truth for the sake of pragmatism, acceptance, uh, and in the name of tolerance, which isn't really tolerance because everybody's invited to the tolerance table except people who insist on an absolute, in which case tolerance becomes uh, the absolute. In, in, it's the one thing that you can't challenge, right? Uh, and so it's, it's, it's self-refuting. It, it breaks in on itself. The idea of relativism as well is self-refuting, right? If you're telling me that all truth is relative, then is that statement an absolute statement or should I take it in relative terms? It's a, it's a question to ask yourself. Um, so when it comes to truth, is there such a thing as truth? I really believe that there is such a thing as truth. I like this, uh, this definition of truth. Truth is the thing that you crash into when you realize that you're wrong. Right? Or alternatively, truth is what God thinks about anything. Right? And so if we want to live healthy, beautiful, productive lives, the best thing we can do for ourselves is to live lives that correspond with truth as it is. Taken in the most simple way, uh, you can think to yourself all day long that there is no gravity. And that, and that may be your preference and you are welcome to it. But when you jump off the roof, you will crash into the floor and realize that you are wrong. Because gravity is real. So too with your existence as a human being on this planet. There are certain things that are just true. Whether you like them or don't like them. And you can reject them but you do so to your peril. And we've been brought up in this, uh, uh, these cultures, so many of us, of rampant individualism and autonomy. Where we feel like because we have the capacity to have an opinion, that our opinions therefore are always right. But the truth is, that they are not always right. And we do much damage to our souls. We, 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 uh, we inflict so much violence on ourselves. There's this phrase that many are the burdens that a man makes for his own back, right? Because of our stubborn refusal to submit to truth as it is. It's, we see this in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve. And whatever you believe about that story, the principle remains is that uh, humanity is, is beautifully living in in uh, harmony with its creator precisely because it is submitted to the truth of its creator. And then there is this moment when um, the, the personification or the metaphor of evil, the serpent in the garden comes and says, no, 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 you can be God. You can, you can determine what is right and wrong for yourself. You can know what is good and evil and you can make that decision. And so they eat of this fruit and they lose their place in the garden. They find themselves east of Eden eventually. And we see Cain and Abel, the first murder, and all the ramifications of those choices, right? And so we are living in the world that is the product of our rebellion because we've thrown off the right constraints of truth. We are, we are, we are driving down a highway on a precarious cliff without any safeguard railing. And we wonder why cars keep driving off the edge. That's why. And so you need truth, and I need truth, and we need the humility to submit ourselves to truth. And from a biblical perspective, of a biblical worldview perspective, I believe that truth has been given. Number one, first and foremost, in the person of Jesus. He himself is the way, the truth, and the life. He is truth embodied. He is truth personified. And then more than that, revealed to us in the scriptures, in the, in the Bible. The Bible gives us a, a way of being, a rule of life uh, that gives us an insight into who this Jesus is. So if I'm saying that Jesus is truth, that's awesome. Who is Jesus? If I go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I get a, I get a window into the personhood of this Jesus. I get to see him, unpack him, understand him. And the more I understand him, the more I, and the more I align myself to him, the more I become like him, submitting myself to his ways and renewing my mind so that it can be restored to his level level of consciousness, uh, I start to find that my life aligns with reality as it is, and I reap the rewards of that blessing, that his word becomes a light to my path and a lamp to my feet, uh, that I store up his truth in my heart, and that he has this way of making crooked paths straight, high places low and low places high, right? And so I would submit to you that from a biblical worldview perspective, we believe in truth. 
And because we live in alignment with that truth, and the, the more and more we do that, the more we reap the rewards of aligning ourselves with reality as it is. We stop jumping off roofs because we're determined to deny the reality of gravity. Instead, we embrace our finitude, we embrace our limitation, and then we start to thrive within the confines of beautiful humanity. Uh, truth is real. Let's talk about axiology, the study of worth. What is of ultimate worth? This is a tricky one uh, because we live in an age of rampant hedonism. Okay, So I would say to you at the moment, because, because of the, the relativism of our time, because of uh, the fact that we've thrown off this idea of truth, um, the ethic of our world is pleasure. Really. Uh, the ethic of our world is pleasure. Do whatever feels good right now. This is why uh, we can we can indulge in our own sort of hedonistic pursuits while the people starve next to us on the streets. And we don't really care. This is why divorce has escalated through the roof in our society and families are broken apart all over the place. Uh, this is why this is why so many things. What, what, what is murder? What is rape in a South African context, right? These are, these are ultimately, they are violent and profound expressions of selfishness rooted in an ethic, a worldview that prizes pleasure over and above everything else. Um, so I can inflict damage on you because my axiology tells me that what makes me feel good is the greatest good. But not so from a biblical worldview. From a biblical worldview, the greatest good is very simply the glory of God. Uh, what does that mean? It means that God is at the center and, and all of creation revolves around our creator. And the greatest good is that he would be made much of, that he would be honored, that he would be glorified, the Christian languages, that, that a spotlight would be put on him and that the world would see the wonder of this God. That's why Jesus came, right? So he's going to the cross and he says, I've come to this very hour and my soul is troubled even to the point of death. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, no, no. It's for this very hour that I came. Father, glorify your name. Right? So the cross is this massive billboard that is an exclamation mark in the center of human history that shouts, look at God, look at God, look at God. So the greatest value, the greatest worth is God himself. And this is why Jesus is such a prize. Not so much because Jesus gets us something else, not because Jesus is an end to something else, but because Jesus is the end in and of himself. The great gift that we find from a biblical perspective with a biblical worldview, the great gift we find in Jesus ultimately is intimacy with our creator, that we become friends with God because he is the highest prize. Where my heart is, my heart is where my treasure lies, right? And he is my treasure. Whom have I in heaven and on earth but you, O God? There is nothing that I desire beside you. You hear it again and again and again in the Psalms. One thing have I desired and that thing will I seek after, that I would dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, gazing upon his beauty and inquiring in his temple, right? So from a biblical worldview, the greatest good, the highest axiology actually is the glory of God. And when, when God is at the center of all things, we find uh, this beautiful picture of shalom flowing out, uh, this idea of peace. And peace not being some kind of transcendent Zen in a cave, uh, escapist spirituality, but peace being the right ordering of things, the way things fit together so that communities and people flourish, so that his kingdom come and his will be done here on earth just as it is in heaven. That's the importance of a biblical worldview, right? And we need the humility to recognize that we have, we have taken Jesus out of the center, taken God out of the center, placed ourselves firmly in the center, and now we serve the God of pleasure, and that's why we're living in so much of the chaos that we are currently living in. Worldview really, really matters. Finally, let's talk about teleology, uh, the study of the end. Where is this all going? <laughs> I love it, man. Uh, the Bible talks about how we are a people of hope when we have a biblical worldview. We're a people of hope. Uh, I remember I was doing a funeral for some people in Johannesburg. And these people, they didn't really believe in God. And yet they had this impulse, maybe something built into them. Maybe the Bible is right. Maybe eternity is written on our hearts. Uh, because re regardless of how much they protested to the absence of God, when someone they loved passed away, still built inside of them was this uh, compulsive need to honor their life. 
in some way. And so they came to our church and we hosted their funeral and uh, helped them grieve and mourn and process. And I remember speaking with the family and I remember saying, uh, where do you think this all goes? And, and they just, their response was nowhere. They really had a conviction that we all just die and become dust and ash. And that was it. It was done. And I remember looking at them genuinely like moved in myself. I think of Jesus when he says he looks at, um, he looked at the people and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And I looked at these people and I thought this is so hopeless. There's no hope. Yeah. Um, and I'm so glad that I don't live in that hopeless worldview. My worldview, my biblical worldview has profound hope because my biblical worldview tells me that this is not how the story ends. So when I turn on the news or open a newspaper or open a website or whatever it is, and there is just craziness going on in the world, as much as I am profoundly engaged in that and moved by that and praying for that, and as much as I, uh, I trust that God's peace will come into those places, and I do, I also know that this is not how the story ends. Uh, the Bible talks about how we as people who who are friends with God through Jesus, that we have a hope anchored in eternity, right? Because we know that there is a coming day when Jesus is coming again and he will bring with him a new heaven and a new earth in its fullest expression and his kingdom rule and reign of shalom and peace and wholeness where there is no more tears and no more pain and no more crying will be established here in the earth and we will rule and reign with Jesus uh, in heavenly places uh, forever. We have an eternal hope. And Paul even talks about this. He says, you know, if our salvation is only for this life, then we are, we are people who are the most to be pitied. But praise God that that's not the case. Praise God that we are not only, we don't only have a beautiful hope in this life, but we have an ultimate hope in the next. And so for me, genuinely, uh, you know, I've often said to people, I'm excited to fall asleep and go be with Jesus. And that's what the Bible describes it. For those of us who are in Christ, we don't die. We fall asleep, you know, um, because he's the firstborn among many brothers. And so we follow him into this new life. And uh, I'm so excited for eternity of friendship with God without any of the hindrances of, of, of sin and any of the hindrances of a broken world. I'm so excited to see that come in its fullness. And I see glimpses of it today breaking through the seams of the temporary as eternity shines. Uh, and it's a beautiful thing to witness, but I'm so excited to experience it in its undiluted, eternal, uncompromised form uh, in the new heaven and the new earth. And, and that's my hope, right? That's my teleology. That's where this is all going the story doesn't end here and because i have hope for the future i can find hope in the present regardless of how difficult the circumstances are now i can have all these convictions right i can have the conviction that people have inherent and eternal worth i can have the conviction that there is truth truth can be known and that i can i, I can align myself with reality as it is and reap the benefits of that alignment i can find an ultimate worth that goes beyond my ego and is rooted in something eternal. And I can ultimately have hope in all things because I know that this is not how the story ends. I can have that because my worldview tells me that that is so. And the question I would leave you with today is what does your worldview tell you? And are you maybe living in, maybe you're struggling with some things. Maybe, maybe some things are difficult right now. Um, Maybe that's just life, and maybe God meets you in that, and that's beautiful. But maybe it's possible that some of the things you're really struggling with are a product of a worldview, that you have a perception of reality as it is, that you've been acting in alignment with that perception, and then the world's been responding to your action, reinforcing that view. And you've gone down and down and down into a spiral of some broken lenses that are harming you and causing much violence to your soul. My invitation to you would be to say that there is a better way to live. There is a biblical worldview that you can put on some new glasses that I believe are truth and that that truth will leave you to life and life in the full. I really pray that you would think about your worldview um, as you're listening to this. And I pray uh, that if your worldview is out of alignment with truth, as all of us are, mine as well, you know, uh, we're all on this ongoing journey of revelation and understanding, that you would really seek to to critique your worldview and to ask yourself some tough questions about what truth is and how you live into it.
Thanks for listening, guys. And uh, if you have enjoyed this, please uh, leave a reference on iTunes, like, share, do all the things. Like I say, follow a podcast. It's still a young podcast, and it'd be so great if it got out there and served people. So leave a reference, do some liking, do some sharing, do the stuff that really helps. I believe in the message, and I would like for it to uh, impact as many people as possible. I hope this has been helpful, and we will chat to you next week.